So welcome to the Laboratory Church. Our mission is to build beloved community through experimenting with creative worship and brave spaces to heal from trauma and disconnectedness together. As I mentioned, you can download the worship bulletin from the chat room. And if you haven't already, please feel free to add your pronouns so we know how to refer to you. If you have any issues or anything that comes up for you during the service, I can't think of a specific trigger warning that should be problematic, but if anything comes up, nonetheless, we are here in the chat room to speak with you, or you can speak to us after the service is over. So we light these candles as a symbol of entering a sacred space together with the fire of the Holy Spirit as our guide and mediator. Join me in our soul care moment. And welcome to this loving kindness meditation. No matter how you're feeling right now, I hope that you can allow yourself to lean into this practice and to be here. Let's get to a comfortable position. Try to sit with your back straight, your chest open, and your arms at your sides or in your lap. Let's begin with a few deep breaths. Breathe in deeply, feeling your body expand, and breathe out, allowing your body to soften and relax. If you haven't already, you can close your eyes. Continue to pay attention to your breath. Find a focal point from which to notice the breath whether that be the cool air entering through your nostrils or the rise and fall of your stomach. Today, we will be practicing loving kindness which is the practice of compassionately paying attention to ourselves and to those around us. Let's bring awareness to the area around our hearts. Try to envision yourself breathing through the heart and the air you breathe infused with the warmth of your love. Bring to mind a color that represents your love and compassion. Imagine this colored glow traveling throughout your body from the bottoms of your feet to the top of your head, filling you with loving kindness. Now offer this loving kindness to yourself by silently repeating the following words. May I be happy. May I be well. May I be safe. May I be peaceful and at ease. Now bring to mind your closest friends and family. Bring awareness to the love and gratitude that you feel for them. And imagine them being filled with the glow of your love and compassion. Say to them, may you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. 
may you be peaceful and at ease. Now expand this circle by sending loving kindness and compassion to your neighbors, acquaintances, strangers, animals, even to those with whom you have difficulty or anger. Use your exhale to let go of any hostility you might be holding on to. And let these people be filled with the glow of your loving kindness. Now, you can let go of this image and bring your attention back into the space that you're in. Notice the weight of your body beneath you and awaken your body with gentle and easy movements. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. We'll now join Thaddeus for our mental health moment. Thanks for that centering. Welcome, everybody. Hope that you all are happy and well, and most of all, peaceful. So let me greet you by saying peace to the people of God. Today's focus is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, first things first. When I talk about living a righteous life, it doesn't mean that we, all of us, are righteous. It means that we're practicing righteousness, okay? And deciding on and living a righteous life in narrative terms means we're actually writing a new story of ourselves every single day. Now, according to the website askinglot.com, when we add the suffix ness, N-E-S-S, -S, when we add the suffix to an adjective, it becomes a noun. Now, the suffix ness means state condition or quality and it's used with an adjective to say something about the state condition or quality of that adjective and the adjective here being righteous this definition brings us face to face with our integrity and willingness to put on this breastplate of righteousness, especially when we're having or experiencing tough feelings or thoughts. So let's deduce this situation by using if-then statements. So if the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, etc. then the breastplate of righteousness, like all the other pieces of the armor of God, is made up of these fruit components. So if the breastplate of righteousness is composed of the fruit of the spirit, then putting on the breastplate or any part of the armor of God for that matter means modeling how to maintain a certain set of thoughts and behaviors. Now in Matthew 16, 24, 26, it's written, then Jesus said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves take up their cross and follow me. This is Jesus speaking. 
all who want to save their lives will lose them. Verse 25. But all who lose their lives because of me will find them. 26. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? And in 24, where it says, pick up your cross or pick up their cross. When we're talking about mental and emotional health, we're talking about the things that burden us, the things that work against our peace and our contentment in life. Those things, um, in psychodynamic terms, we call that our personal work, right? Now, the state, condition, or quality of our righteousness reflects the degree to which we've taken up this cross of ours, not of the world's. Our personal work and the state, condition, or quality of the breastplate becomes viewable to God and to one another as we practice this. Now, some first responders and others use body armor to protect the general area of the body that the metaphorical breastplate of righteousness is said to cover. This area hosts many vital organs and can easily lead to physical and or metaphorically speaking, a spiritual death if these vital systems are damaged beyond repair. So by adapting the worldview of Christ and picking up our crosses, individually, we present the community and God with a much higher quality material to build the realm on earth as it is in heaven. This kind of thinking and being are essential ways and means to birthing a new communal reality, no longer based on the exchange of harm. We're calling for a culture based on the exchange of interpersonal cooperation and care. And righteousness protects like the other pieces of the armor, these vital functions and systems of compassion. And as the church, we are ambassadors to the world and we must clothe ourselves in the righteousness of God that we may withstand the wiles of the enemy. And in closing, I would request that we ask ourselves today and every day, are we actively writing a life story that fits the coming realm of God or does our life story that we write every day fit the world that's passing away? Until we meet again. Peace. Please join with me now in a reading of our scripture for today. And this is from Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, in the continuation of our series on the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all of the saints. Will you pray with me? God, our creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you for you and all for you are our rock and our redeemer. And we ask that the spirit will speak to us and protect us as we do your will. Amen. So far, we have talked about the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and shoes to spread the gospel of peace. And we've discussed how all of these are used to protect us from the attacks of evil. And this allows us to follow the law of loving one another as ourselves while staying in tune with the fruit of the spirit who guides us. Our focus today on Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we will be focused on the belt of truth next time. But before we delve into the specifics of the breastplate of righteousness, I wanted to start by talking about the word righteousness. If we're being honest, we often hear this word in coordination with judging others as not doing the right thing. And it's also often associated with being self-righteous. Now, this is not to say that we should not call out problematic behavior when we see or experience it. Yet, there is a fine line from having righteous anger and indignation to condemning and being condescending to others from a place of moral superiority when we don't like what we see or hear. In actuality, the better way to define righteousness is right acting. As in, how would God have us act from a place of love and mutuality? And as Thaddeus mentioned, this is a practice. This is not something that naturally comes to us and that we just do all the time, though that would be lovely. So this is now where the breastplate comes in. The breastplate is what protects us from damaging reactivity in our places of pain, as well as allows us to have compassion for what might be happening in the other person who is unintentionally causing us harm. So in a sense, we're protecting our hearts, right? The breastplate is also in place when we implement healthy boundaries that protect us from those who are actively and intentionally trying to harm or abuse us. And this is also to remind us not to give our vulnerability to those who have not provided the safety for us to do so. Mutuality in relationships centers around the idea that people are concerned with the well-being, respect, and goals of both themselves and the person or people they are in relationship with. In this relationship style, it requires mutual respect, a balance of needs and desires, honest communication, as well as the ability to maintain those healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries include the ability to name when something is bothering you, as well as being able to say no and accept no as an answer from others. Mutuality allows us to test whether our boundaries are in fact healthy. Think of it this way. Part of what can root bitterness in our hearts and can lead to larger conflicts is when we say yes to things that we want to say no to. 
We live in a productivity driven society and a society that measures success by money made and power achieved. We have often talked about individualism and competition, including discussing how we do not align with those in our values. Today, I want to focus on the intricacies of what that looks like in everyday experiences. Because of the societal pressure to achieve, to please, to be liked and loved, to be chosen, to get ahead in a culture riddled with systematically unfair distribution of resources from money to raw material to human value itself, we have all been placed in a cooking pot like crabs. And we've been told that the only way to get ahead is to climb on top of everybody else and fight to get out of that pot. In this metaphor, the cooking pot is initially filled with cool water so that we don't realize we've been cooked until the water is already boiling. This is so embedded in our programming in every layer of living in this country that we forget that an outside force who benefits from us being in the cooking pot put us there in the first place. And they took us out of our natural environment. So God created whole oceans, seas, sandy beaches with food to eat and places to sleep and trees to climb for the crab. This is not the same as a cooking pot. And thus the idea that the crab is expected to thrive in that environment of abundance. So another way to look at the cool water of this pot is includes the niceties and cultural politeness, which guilt us into giving more than we are comfortable with. And this allows us to be consumed rather than honored for our contribution to others. This includes concepts such as culturally expected and exploitative volunteerism, unpaid internships, being forced to accept unlivable wages for our work when we are paid, as well as being mined for ideas for the benefit of others. We see this regularly in the form of cultural appropriation, intellectual property theft, plagiarism, flattery, by the way, and all other sorts of sneaky competitive tactics under the guise of cooperation for the purposes of competition. Winning matters, even if it's at the expense of the well-being of the person who made us successful or profitable. So today, I'm going to say it bluntly. Anything we do that intentionally profits off the ideas mental, emotional, and or physical labor of someone else without mutual benefit is wrong. And I would even call it theft. Each person in a given relationship should be free to define what mutuality looks like for them. The whole point though is about being fair and ensuring that all parties are lifted justly. Competition under a scarcity model causes people to think and believe that they can only win, which means getting their needs or wants met, if someone else loses. And that simply isn't true. This competition of I can only get mine if you lose yours fuels toxic interpersonal relationships and it fuels lying and manipulation over authentic asking with the knowledge that no might be the answer and we may just have to accept that. So what can we do differently? Well, it's an effort. 
in each and every action that we take every day, we need to examine whether it is mutual. We have to consider what we ask of others and what others ask of us. And we do need to be selective with whom we exert our limited time and energy. Also, we need to check if that energy uplifts ourselves and the people around us or whether it holds anyone back. So I'm going to show you a quick video to demonstrate a point called the tragedy of the commons, which we would call the tragedy of competition. Back in 1833, William Foster Lloyd noticed something fascinating about the so-called common pastures. In other words, pastures without an owner, which can be used by everyone. He noticed that these common pastures were in considerably worse shape than those which had an owner. Why? Simply because the short-term self-interest of the people who were using those pastures made them consume too many resources, and in the long run, everyone suffered. George asked himself, should I buy another animal? And decided that yes, he'd make more money that way. He knew he was overloading the pasture, but didn't care. He wanted the extra money. The problem is that everyone did the same thing. In the end, the pasture was brutally overloaded and therefore became unusable. Some people made short-term profits, but in the long run, everyone lost. As far as the pastures which had an owner were concerned, this didn't happen because it was in the best interest of the owners to exploit their property sustainably. Today, similar situations occur frequently. For example, with fishing grounds such as the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, which used to be home to a huge cod population. About 50 years ago, however, technology enabled people to catch a lot more fish than before. The fish population, and thereby the fishing industry, collapsed by the 90s and might never recover. The same way, humans are doing everything from polluting their Earth's oceans and atmosphere to generating traffic jams during rush hour. There we have it, the tragedy of the comets. That video demonstrates what I've been talking about. It shows how we as a culture have succumbed to focus on trying to maximize our individual situations over the good of all of us and our shared resources. In this way, we scheme to find ways to get ours, and in the end, it causes everyone to lose. It may seem counterintuitive to combine boundaries and the ability to say no with mutuality and sharing, right? But let me explain. It is actually a way to ensure that things remain in balance and that no one person gives to the point of being unhealthy, just as no one would be allowed then to take to the point of being unhealthy. Healthy relationships, just like healthy ecological and economic environments, are based on balance. If one person becomes too much of a giver, they are likely to burn out and their hearts can become hardened and bitter. Whereas if a person becomes too much of a taker, they begin to feel entitled to what they take without any thought to how it will affect those they are taking from. This, as the tragedy of the commons, or competition as we say, demonstrates, causes a shortage of resources for everyone, ultimately including the taker. So we have to take time to ask tough questions of ourselves when we truly live in this way in every minute. And we have to really understand and see the microaggressions and controls that are enforced in so many of our cultural traditions. So to counter the tragedy of the commons or competition, do y'all remember the concept of Ubuntu? I preached about it uh, a few weeks or months ago, but as a reminder, it's from the Bantu language, and it means that everyone is a part of the whole, and it holds a philosophy of I am because we all are. 
When I last spoke of this, I shared a specific story about a Western dude who was in a small village in Africa, and he tried to play a game with the children of the village to compete for apples. And they, in turn, cooperated rather than competed, and they ultimately shared the apples instead of giving them all to the winner. This amazed him. So as a church community, one way that we practice mutuality is by understanding that we all need each other. This takes all of this work that we do with love and compassion takes each one of us to promote the good of the whole. While we grow food, distribute food and provide services to folks in our neighborhood, it is not a top-down or paternalistic approach. There's absolutely a need to meet basic requirements that people like food and housing, these are basic needs. But in addition to charity, we need justice. And in giving to others and building relationships, it means that we see people in need as human beings who have the opportunity to fulfill their own contribution to the whole and that those contributions should be honored even when they also have needs. And every person, regardless of their level of need, is a beloved child of God. You see, we too were in need of food during the pandemic and we also needed help with gardening and distributing food. Last fall, we heard that there was free food that was available that we could share with our neighborhood. And we were able to enlist folks like DJ to help us pick the food up to give away. We were able to enlist the help of Teddy and Jill to help divide and distribute the food and talk to people. We received a donation of a vehicle from Ellen, and this allowed us to have a mobile pantry so that we could bring food to people where they were, since they had no transportation, or and still don't, to get groceries themselves. In our developing relationships with those that we serve, one of the people whom we've shared food with has a lawnmower. We don't and we're required to mow the lawn. So without a lawnmower, you can imagine that's pretty difficult. So now, because he has a lawnmower, we pay him to mow our lawn and he's now gotten jobs cutting the lawns of our neighbors as well. And when we have a pantry day, if we can't get all of our regular people to help, Thaddeus is an expert in just asking for help from the people who we're serving and they always help. They're happy to. They're happy to say, okay, yeah, I'll help you give out food, but what do I do? Who do I talk to? Who do I hand it to? And in our mentoring program, our mentors and our mentees all help us now with weeding the garden, laying mulch, and while they do this, they're learning interpersonal skills, learning responsibility, and we pay them a small stipend as well because we want to teach them that they are valued in a way that is meaningful to them. Now, every person who, no matter how much need they have, they all have gifts to contribute to the people around them. I've mentioned in other sermons that the most generous people I've ever encountered in my life are always the people who have the least amount to share according to our standards. Yet, they realize our interconnectedness and they see the value of helping one another. Because we have talked about the protection of our hearts in order to fuel our ability to do right acting, I have homework. When someone asks you to do something that you do not want to do, notice how you would like to respond. Now, if you say yes, when you really want to say no, I would like you to stop and ask yourself why and notice how you feel in your body. Now, 
do the exact same noticing when you say no to something that you don't want to do and notice how this act makes you feel. And if you want extra credit, you can also notice what happens when you ask someone to do something and they say yes or no to you. But that's just extra credit. The main focus though, notice your reactions to when you say yes, when you want to say no. Because ultimately at the end of the day, knowing and honoring yourself allows you to be healthy, which in turn creates more health in the people around you. And now we enter our time of offering. As you can see, the links are on our website. I wanted to say just a couple of words, and that is as we continue to do the work we are called to do through tending to the minds, bodies, and spirits of our community, I would like to continue the theme of mutuality. If you regularly attend and have personally been fed in mind, body, or spirit by our worship and study labs and or our community services, we would ask you to consider how you can add your unique gifts and resources to this community to help us continue and expand our ability to provide for others. Even as you may give to other churches or groups who also feed you in some way, we would greatly appreciate your including us. We thank you and we appreciate how God is working in all of our lives and in all of our communities. Now will you join with me in prayer? We thank you, oh God, for your love and support. And we thank you that you provide in what in each other the ability to do the works of love in this world. We thank you that you are in fact a God of abundance and that you inspire us in the ways of demonstrating and carrying forth this abundance to all of your creation, even as we do it in a healthy way. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. As we enter our time of communion, uh, Jody will be leading us, so I will turn it over to her. Thank you. You're welcome. Instead of us uh, thinking about the table, I'd like for us to think about those of us who are gathered around the table. And I wonder if we might consider what does the Lord see as he looks upon us gathering around his table? Does he see friends, friends of one another, friends of, of Christ? Does he see us as uh, brothers and sisters? again, of one another or of Christ? Does he see us as a family? Does he see us, um, more importantly, unified as a community, one in the body of Christ? I'd like us to consider that as we um, think about taking communion tonight, that we uh, not only take it as one, but we act as one and we love as one. So now from the word of God, I'll read from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here we have the bread. And as we break it, we are pondering the body of Christ broken for us. Then we have the cup. And again, we're pondering his blood spilled for us. So if we could, as one, 
Let's proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again together. And now Jill will lead us in our prayer. I'm going to open um, the prayer with an excerpt from St. Patrick's Breastplate Prayer. I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead, God's eye to watch, God's might to stay, God's ear to hearken to my need. The wisdom of my God to teach, God's hand to guide, God's shield to ward, the word of God to give me speech, God's heavenly host to be my guard. Lord, as we open our hearts towards justice and healing, let us always know that we are shielded and armed for all challenges through you and this church community. And at this time of communion, hear our prayer of joining together to keep us from being short-sighted and instead keep us focused on the fruit of the Spirit, for I am because we are. Amen. Thank you both so much. Let me lead us out in the benediction. And of course, as always, you are welcome to stay afterwards and we can chat. So let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as challenges arise. Amen.